and welcome to another episode of Ubar. In today's episode, we are going to go from zero to hero with Stage Maker. If you want to learn more about serverless, cloud computing, or software engineer practices in general, subscribe to my channel in the red button below. I post a video every Tuesday and every Thursday. So, let's get So, yes, as you heard it, we are going to get started with SageMaker. This is another episode in my series of This is not a podcast because I could not be talking about SageMaker. It, uh, <laughs> no. Uh, so, I invited to this episode Antia Bhatt. She is a developer advocate in AWS. She works with me. She's an expert on machine learning and she will tell us everything we need in order to uh, get started with SageMaker. This is a wrong, it's a long video, but it's so packed with information that uh, it's, it's amazing. I, I learned so much when I was interviewing her and, and, and going through all her demos. This is packed with demos and, and I'm so excited to have this out in the channel. So let's go to the interview. So today we have an amazing guest here with us, it's Antia Bot. I hope I say it right. She's a developer advocate for AWS and welcome Antia, I hope you are having a great day and thank you for being here. Thanks so much Marcia, yes. Excited to be a guest in your show. Yes, uh, I know you're writing a book and you're doing a lot of things in Germany, you're a developer advocate there, but maybe you can tell me a little bit more about what you do, what you like about AWS, how long have you been here, and I don't know, things about you. <laughs> yes, yeah, sure. So as you can see here in my background, um, I'm actually based in uh, Düsseldorf, Germany, and I joined AWS a couple of months ago in, uh, in August last summer. Um, working as a developer advocate, uh, focusing a lot on machine learning and AI technologies. And uh, yeah, in my time before, um, I worked in a couple of companies, um, pretty much in the IT sector for, for many years, um, working in, uh, in infrastructure and in data center environments, but also um, just before I joined AWS in big data technologies. And um, yeah, most recently got super excited about uh, data science, machine learning, and pretty much focusing um, my day-to-day -day job on showing you some exciting demos. Yes, and that's what we are going to see a lot here today. Uh, I never talk about machine learning because I have my, my knowledge is as much as recognition can do for me on machine learning. So I think I will be learning a lot here with you and I hope everybody watching as well. But you live sometime in Costa Rica, you speak Spanish. Uh, one day I will bring you to my Spanish episodes. <laughs> And you're a banana expert. I did. So, yes. Yeah. So during my college time, I actually spent one year abroad studying in, uh, in Costa Rica. And, uh, yeah, the funny thing I learned in my time there is that there is, like, hundreds of different types of bananas. So I just only knew one before. Thanks and I think, uh, yeah, the biggest revelation is that there's an apple banana. I think, who knows, right? Does it taste like apple? It is a weird, like a smooth taste, but not quite as an apple, but uh, yeah, it's just surprising. Interesting. So many good things I learned besides uh, yeah. speaking yeah. computer yeah. science language and Spanish there. You need to try in some machine learning to recognize bananas. Yeah, <laughs> like the famous hot dog, not hot dog app. We should do exactly. one for the With kind the of types of bananas. Exactly. That would be a fun demo. <laughs> <laughs> So today the topic is from zero to SageMaker Hero. You have a lot of demos, so maybe we can get started with what is SageMaker. I've been hearing about that since its launch and I never opened that. So I think you're here to enlighten For us. Sure. <laughs> so yeah, let me take you all um, through an introduction of SageMaker. So I actually call today's session from zero to Amazon SageMaker Hero. I thought initially about calling it just a beginner's guide, but actually there are so many great uh, tools and features I want to show you. So we're getting pretty um, into the service pretty quickly. So it's really more of a, a jump start for you. So let's 
see how we go from zero to hero here. Um, just to start with a little bit of introduction for those of you who might not have been in machine learning data science for too long. The machine learning workflow really consists of a couple of steps, right? So before you start, you actually have to collect and label your data. And, and many times the, the data is not very clean. You know, there might be missing fields. There might be some, I don't know, weird um, sentence signs. So the first step is really to make sure that the data is in a good format. You clean it to make sure there's no missing values. And then you can start developing your model. So for and example, for the first two steps, uh, using some, I don't know, for ingesting the data, maybe some kinesis fire hose or something like that. Uh, and then for cleaning, maybe glue or some kind of process lambda or I don't know. Exactly, yeah. So the easiest way to get the data in is, is if an application writes data, for example, straight into F3. And then you can use all the goodness of tools really AWS provides, whether you're using Athena to do some initial um, interactive SQL queries right on the data to figure out, you know, learn a little bit more about the data. And then you can really use any of the services you're familiar with, um, you like to clean and transform the data. And also um, we will see in the demo in just a bit how you can also use actually a functionality called processing jobs from SageMaker oh. um, to do a couple of those things. Nice. All right, and then when you're past those steps, you develop your model code, so you still have to code, um, and then you train the model, you check how good it is doing, and then you keep optimizing, right? So this is the little loop here in the picture. So you basically work in an iterative process in optimizing and making the model better. And then finally, once you have that ready, you deploy it into production and it can scale and make fun predictions, right? Whether identifying bananas or whatever your use case will be. That sounds really good. Yeah, I'm lost after the part where you start with the model. That's <laughs> mystery. <laughs> we'll, we'll walk you all through there. No worries. <laughs> all right, so let's actually see where SageMaker can help, right? And SageMaker, tackles a lot of those steps in the meantime. So there were a lot of good services added, capabilities added um, over the last couple of months. So actually you can use SageMaker right now, think of it as kind of a, a managed machine learning service, providing you with a platform with a lot of different functionalities, whether it's in the beginning here to label your data with a service called Amazon SageMaker Ground Truth, or it's really when you start building the model in notebook environments, in a new IDE environment called SageMaker Studio. And then if you don't have any idea about machine learning, you can also use automated machine learning with a service called Autopilot. Oh. So if you got lost in the training, um, developing the model code, that might be a good option maybe uh, for you to check out. And for everyone who really has fun and, and experience and wanna dive deep into um, the machine learning parts, uh, we do have great functionalities here around debugging the model, um, tr keeping track of the experiments, tuning it. So it's really spanning across from the start, labeling the data, building the model, training and tuning to deploying it into production. A lot of these things were launched in Rainbow last year, so they're pretty new. Exactly, right? Yeah, there was like uh, many of them and uh, the platform keeps growing. So yeah. it's it's really exciting to uh, to watch out for whatever SageMaker announces. Yeah. All right, so let's take you from zero to hero here. So I'm going to show you in the quick demo afterwards um, how to start with creating a SageMaker notebook instance. This is a good start um, for you to clone your GitHub or other code repo right away. And then you can work with the code. You can explore, prepare your data. Uh, we're going to start building a model, we're going to train and deploy it, and we're going to make a prediction. One, so one question. It's going to be a fast uh, ride. Yes. What is this, uh, you said that it's a managed service, so it means that it's fully serverless, that you pay for what you use when you're using SageMaker, or it's like exactly. an instance that is running? So the good thing is, yes, exactly. So for example, if you're training the model through SageMaker, you only pay for the seconds the instance that SageMaker deploys on your behalf to train, really just for the seconds it trains. Nice. So you will see those in the overview. There's also the capabilities of using spot instances, 
which makes it even more cost attractive. And yeah, SageMaker basically tries to abstract as much from the infrastructure as possible. So you do have the control. You can say like train my instance on maybe a GPU instance or a compute optimized one, but you don't have to care about actually spinning those instances up. That's, That's all really done. Nice. All right, so let's actually have a quick look at what we're doing in the demo here. So machine learning obviously needs data. And I'm going to use the Amazon customer reviews data set. And I put it here if uh, anyone wants to check that out. Amazon has published the data. If you go to Amazon.com, and I'm sure many of you have um, purchased items there or have maybe looked for items, um, most probably you will always look at the ratings, right? Is that a product others liked? And, um, and maybe also read a couple of those reviews. And Amazon actually published the data set with more than 100 million of those customer reviews wow. dating from 1995 to 2015. <laughs> That's a crazy amount of data. <laughs> That's a crazy amount of data. It's even multilingual. So if anyone is excited to run maybe natural language processing in Spanish or uh, French wow. or German, um, it's also containing reviews from the different marketplaces in the countries. Yeah, maybe don't download it to your computer. It will take all the space. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So that's a good point. And I'm going to show you how you can actually load that now into, into SageMaker. So with that, let me jump to my console window. So we're now in the AWS console, which should be hopefully familiar. Yes, um, you people here have been seeing that a lot, so. In this channel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so make it really easy. So for you to find SageMaker, just really type in SageMaker. And that brings you straight to the service page. You see here a quick overview of all the different capabilities and functionalities. And also here in the left menu. So a good starting point is really if you start from zero to go to the notebook instances. And this is where you would start creating a new environment. So I'll just show you quickly how you would do that. So you open up the dialogue here. Let me zoom in a little bit. And you can just give it a name here. That's my maybe my workspace notebook. You can pick any of the instance types that are supported. So just to clarify, this is for the notebook server, the Jupyter notebook server, which is also provided and managed by SageMaker. And you can say you can deploy it on a smaller instance family or a larger one. And this really depends on what you're about to do with a notebook. So if you're planning on doing a lot of processing in the notebook itself, obviously make sure it has enough resources. Um, if you're doing all of the processing in the cloud and in, in the AWS environment, um, then you can also just pick a smaller one. I'm lost. One question. So the processing happens in the notebook or in the cloud you mentioned. What? So when we are doing the training of the machine learning, you will write a program, you will write some code, and you will show us how we can decide where it runs. Exactly. So what many data scientists do, they pull a sample data in the notebook and just try to do a little bit of what I call ad hoc. Okay data science and run some tests and look into the data, poke around. And then when you're running the large scale job on the large data sets, you would obviously do that on the cloud instances. Oh, but okay. many people just pull in a little bit of data in the notebook and you know start experimenting. So this really depends on, on what you're trying to do. Obviously, if you're operating on a large data set, um, that is always a good <laughs> choice to run it on the cloud instances. But depending on what people want to do, right? Some exactly. people might want to download a little bit of data here. So in this case, I just make sure I have an instance here, which is maybe a good ratio, a good mix, right? So if I'm developing, I'm also sometimes pulling down data or I pull down a model file. And this can take some, some space. So whatever you think it's helpful in your environment, um, pick an instance type here, and maybe you want to increase the volume size as well if you download data. So yes. this is what I normally do. Then you also obviously need an IAM role to make it, uh, give it the access and privileges it needs. 
you can, if you don't have an idea what you um, should configure here, you can also tell it to create a role for you. And here, basically, you're giving Amazon SageMaker full access so we can actually work in that environment. And then you would probably specify it and limit it down to an S3 bucket you're that's, working with in your region. That's always a good practice. That's always a good practice, exactly. So you could just put in anything in here um, which you created, basically. So I cancel out of that as I do have a role already. So I'm just selecting that one. And then basically you can do settings like VPC settings. So you can select your VPCs, the subnets you want this server why, to be Why you will in. need that for the notebook? That is applied to the notebook instance, correct. So you just want to make sure that you're operating in the VPC environments where you would normally do in your AWS. OK, environment. so if you have defined some VPCs, then you can pick those. Yes, you can obviously use the default ones, which are shown in my demo yeah. account here. And uh, if you have set up your own exactly. VPC settings, feel free to apply them here. All right, um, another thing you can do here in the setup is you can clone a Git repo right away. So oh. this is really cool, right? So let's assume you have been developing code already. So just point it here to your public Git repo. You can also set up private Git repos and then it gets cloned straight into this instance. Nice. So that's really cool. So you just... And whenever you pull, uh, make some changes, it will come automatically into the instance. Exactly. You nice. can run your git pull, git push commands right from the instance. Awesome. And then obviously you can give it some tags and then you would just hit here, create notebook instance. So as, as done in many of the cooking shows, mm -hmm. I already prepared something <laughs> for us. So we don't have to, to wait for the instance to get deployed here. So I started this instance here. And once you see that uh, in service, you can then use either Jupyter or Jupyter Lab to connect. And if we open that, this is our environment. Okay. And I actually also cloned a Git repo for us. And let me just quickly show you that repo. So um, as you mentioned in the beginning, um, I'm writing a book together with a, uh, with a coworker from us in the US. Um, it's called Data Science on Amazon Web Services. And we're actually developing and sharing code as we um, work on the book. So this is the code repo I pulled down. And you can see here um, a little bit uh, about the book. And we're also hosting regular workshops. But here's a, a good outline, basically, what you find in that repo and what we're going to do here just in a quick um, walkthrough in this, in this demo now. So we really kind of want to show you how you can work with AWS in the data science world from either you want to use one of those automated services, which I quickly touched on, like autopilot, yeah. or even a fully managed AI service Comprehend, which does NLP, natural language processing for you. And then um, the next steps are really if you want to do the hands-on part, so you're eager to <laughs> develop models yourself. So I'm going to show you here in a bit and I'll walk you through a couple of those um, Git repo code folders. So we have sample notebooks that show you how to ingest the data. We can do some exploration, preparation, and then we're also going to train, optimize the model and deploy it to production. That's super cool. And you also see, by the way, here, um, a lot of the services. So you see it's not only SageMaker, but especially as we also quickly talked about in the beginning, you might want to use a service like Athena to um, query the service with SQL queries, yes. right? Three. And maybe also you will see another of other examples. Blue comes up here as well. Um, you can use QuickSight if you want to visualize in a dashboard. Yeah, that, so, that will be really cool because uh, I have a series on building a serverless analytics pipeline and I show an example of a pipeline that had SageMaker and everybody's like, we want to see the SageMaker thing. Well, here you have it. <laughs> <laughs> so here are all the examples, exactly. exactly. <laughs> so um, feel free, this Git repo is public and shared if you go to github.com um, data-science-on-aws. Yeah, the links are down. <laughs> yes, perfect. And, uh, and then you can poke around here in that code and give it a run yourself after this, uh, after this video. <laughs> So what I did, I cloned this repo here into my Jupyter Notebook instance that got provisioned as part of the SageMaker platform. So I don't have to 
take care of the Jupiter environment that is managed for me. Nice. And I can now jump into um, my Git repo code here. So in the first step, let's just make sure that we actually do have an F3 bucket to use. So I'm going to execute um, this notebook here. So basically, for, anyone... for, for dummies, I have a question because I never try a Jupyter notebook. So you have put this in your GitHub repo and this Jupyter lab can identify those files ending with IP YAML kind of, no, YNL and shows you this type of editor. You don't need to do anything. This is as correct. easy as it gets. Correct. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. You can think of it like your development environment. Yeah, exactly. um, some people like tools um, locally, they work with PyCharm maybe. Um, many others work with those so-called notebooks, which Jupyter is just an example. Yeah. And those are very interactive environments. That's so you can see here, I can put in here code, I can uh, run it in there. Do import commands here, whatever. Um, and then I can also execute those cells right away. So what I do here is just shift enter and then the cell get executed. Wow, that's super cool. And you see here, I pull in, um, probably most of you listening yeah. to the videos are familiar with Bodo, the Python SDK. We pull in the SDK for SageMaker and then we can use those, as you can see here, to um, retrieve the session information, our region we're currently working in, etc. Nice. And what SageMaker also provides is a default bucket. So this is what I'm actually querying here for. And you see the SageMaker default bucket is just a combination of SageMaker, the region I'm currently operating in, and your AWS account okay. number. Okay, so this is created by the by automatically. This is created automatically, so this also helps if you're running the code in your environment. Um, you know, you don't have to hard code any bucket information exactly. here, so you can just pull your own default bucket here. And you can also specify, obviously, if you work with a dedicated bucket here, um, just put it in. But for the sake of the demos, it's always nice yeah, um, to have some code that actually executes everywhere. <laughs> Infrastructure as code all the way. <laughs> all the way. <laughs> All right, so we've made sure here, as you can see, that the bucket is set up and we can actually do some ls list commands here. So we're good to go and actually take it a step further. Um, I just want to quickly show you here the uh, section two. So you can um, prepare the data set for specific tasks. And the section two here focuses on auto ML, automated machine learning. And two examples we've put in here is actually using um, Amazon SageMaker Autopilot, which is a complete automated way to just point the service to your data. And then Autopilot figures out which is the best um, algorithm to use, how to prepare the data. It trains the model for you and then pre presents you basically with the final results. So this is really cool. Um, in Definitely. preparation, you need to bring the data in some format. So, and this notebook here shows you how to do that. So again, we're using this Amazon Customer Reviews data set. And here is the schema of the data. So you see it consists of a lot of uh, good and rich information, the marketplace. So that this is kind of the US marketplace. It has, um, if you want to pull it down for um, France, I think there is some for Japan. Um, Spanish speaking samples we're using just for the easiness of the demo here, the US samples in English. Customer IDs, review IDs, product IDs, um, some more information about which is the product parent, etc., the title, category, super um, important. Um, so you can see which category <laughs> is, it, is it, you know, um, digital video, etc. And then also, obviously, the star rating. So if the review person um, gave it a five, a four, a one, yeah. and uh, a little more information like the number of helpful votes, um, is it a verified purchase? And then what we're really interested in is the review body, which is the text of review okay. and the star rating. So here's an example how you can prepare the data. And what I'm going to do is just I'm going to do a run all cells, which is actually a shortcut here. So <laughs> the while you're talking a lot, um, the cells actually get executed. And what you can see here, we're downloading the data set from um, the public bucket where this data set is shared into, and here I'm doing actually this local, right? So okay. I'm pulling the data down locally. Into your instance, here. in this particular instance. 
Exactly. So now I'm in the instance. And this is why you want to make sure if you're doing that, um, A, you're not pulling down, you know, the gigabytes or petabytes of data. Exactly. Um, but if you're just pulling what I'm doing here, a single category of digital software, um, that is not too big. So I can actually pull this down locally here. And then this is what, what, what you would do if you just explore the data and uh, read the data in here. It's a TSV, a tab separated file. So similar to comma separated. Yeah. You can put it in a data frame here, pandas data frame, which gives you ways to visualize data nice. very quickly. So you see here actually a sneak peek of the data, the marketplace, some random customer <laughs> ID. Um, those are randomized and anonymized, yeah. so don't, uh, don't worry. And um, you don't care don't in the analyzing of data who is who, so. Exactly, I mean, you can do some funny, um, actually queries, which I show you in a bit. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, don't worry, those are anonymized, just IDs representing a customer, also a review ID and so on. And you see, can see here the product category I'm using now is digital software. It's a pretty small category, so we can easily work on that here in the notebook. You see the star ratings, and if you scroll all to the right, the review body, which is actually the text. So far so good, mm -hmm. it's a little work. Please cancel. <laughs> so there's all, all different kinds of um, reviews. So it's it's super exciting using that data set actually. Yeah, it's not test data, it's real. It's real data, it's real data. So you can also visualize a little bit here. You can see um, the star ratings. Um, so you can see how many reviews and which star ratings. So obviously what this tells us is many people rate when they're super excited <laughs> about a product, right? The, so the fives got the highest number of ratings. And also they tend to rate when they're really dissatisfied. Typical. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's not so much, you know, when it's okay. Some yeah. people still provide a review, but yeah, the best and the worst always is kind of <laughs> polarizing. Um, but it also tells us coming back to the data science world, it's a pretty unbalanced data set, right? So in the data science world, if you're training a model, you want to make sure you're operating and not like injecting a bias, right? So this, by using this data, the model would learn um, that there's more fives and, 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 and ones and might draw wrong assumptions. Exactly. So you want to make sure to balance the data. So this is what we're doing here. So we're basically just running a couple of free samples and I'm doing it pretty, pretty easy here, just cutting it down to the number of the lowest category. Okay. So every category has the same number. There are more sophisticated ways to do it. I just, you know, take it uh, the easy way here. One question, what are we training this model to do? So I want to train the model to give us the star rating, a prediction. So I want to give it a text like, I really like this product. And the model should tell us that's the three. Okay, so you don't care about like, that's why you want to balance it out. That's why you need to do this preparation. If in other cases, yeah. maybe the preparation will be a different one if you want to get a different output. Yes, you always have to, to look into obviously what's your use case, but you always want to make sure that you're not have imbalances, right? That one value is just overrepresented for some reason, right? So it might be good reasons, but in many cases, um, it would draw the wrong assumptions when you train the model. So you always want to make sure you're not, you know, creating a bias already <laughs> in the data set. <laughs> That's a topic of a totally different discussion, bias in machine learning. And <laughs> sure. That's a for another day. <laughs> and more so, philosophical. Maybe we need wine for that one. <laughs> exactly. So we balance the data set here. So the model actually learns, you know, there's the exact same number of reviews, whether it's a one star rating or a five star rating, because we don't want to have that um, influence that it says like, you know, 80% it's always a five. So I just going to say it's a five. Exactly. Lazy machine. All right. So, and we also cut down like all the different columns we saw to just contain the star rating and the review body, because that's what we're training on. And this is what you call the labeled data set. So we're giving it the answers in the training, right? With the star rating. So it learns the, um, how to predict on the text, which star rating. And then later on, we can just give it a text and it will predict the rating for us. Exactly. So um, we're writing out the data here. So one special um, thing we have to do, Autopilot expects as input data, a CSV file with the header information. 
So with the column names? Exactly. So you need to format it that way. Exactly. So we're formatting this here. Um, funny thing, um, if you're using a service like uh, Comprehend, that expects a CSV without a head. <laughs> oh. <laughs> So when you're working with the services, make sure to double check um, the input data requirements. And we're just basically creating those data sets here. And then we're storing the information where to find it here in variables, which you can actually do in a neat way here. Um, just really kind of easy way to share those across the notebooks. So we're also storing like where we have the information. So this is a little bit of data preparation just in the notebook. Um, we haven't yet leveraged really the, um, the broad set on, of capabilities of SageMaker, right? So we're just like exploring here. Yeah. Um, here's the notebook if you open up the 02 later, um, how to actually start the autopilot job. I will probably skip this for this demo. Um, feel free to run it yourself. Exactly. It walks you through the whole process of actually how you're um, starting the autopilot job, analyzing the data. It does the feature engineering for you. It does the model training tuning, and it also generates um, what we call it's the white list uh, white box approach of SageMaker. It generates notebooks documenting all its findings, so you wow. can really see what it found in the data exploration, so how your data looks like, and then also produces those candidate definition notebooks. So feel free to um, to run this, execute this. Um, it's probably another session for its yeah. own um, as part of this um, video series, but <laughs> feel free to, to explore it here in, uh, in the repo. Or then All you right. can put in the comments if you want anti-vac. <laughs> <laughs> so for now, um, let's really um, show a little bit of the SageMaker capabilities. So I go to the ingest phase. And here again, um, I'm pulling down what we've done quickly um, in the notebook before. I'm doing now really in the cloud environment. So the Amazon customer reviews data set is shared in a public F3 bucket. And what I'm going to do here, and I'm also just running this quickly, run all cells. I'm pulling it down and here I just do a quick LS command before. Everything, so you see all here the, the categories. Link well files. So those are all the public shared reviews. And you can also see the categories. So there is Musical instruments, I didn't even know that uh, Amazon.com has the category. They um, sell everything. Outdoors, PC, pet products. So feel free <laughs> to, uh, to dive into those if you're, if you're curious. Um, this is all that is shared. It's also, by the way, available in Parquet file format. Mm. So if you're doing analysis, Parquet is a very popular file format optimized um, for column queries. So especially if you're running a SQL query and saying, the where clause where category equals, let's say, books, um, the column optimization is really helping yeah. us to do a high performance query. That's nice for Athena, for example. Exactly. So the data set is also shared in Parquet, which just makes it really easy for nice. us. So what I'm doing here, um, again, I'm pulling in here my SDKs, and basically I'm copying now from the public S3 bucket to my default bucket, which I'm using. So I'm pulling down into my, let's say, AWS, you know, bucket yeah. and, and VPC to operate locally in my cloud account um, with, the, with the data set. Exactly. So this is what I'm doing. So you can see here, um, I pulled down for this purpose two categories, um, but obviously operating in the cloud, you can also pull in the 130 million <laughs> reviews, when I go big. Um, for now, I put in uh, digital software and digital video games. Nice. Then I'm actually using Athena. So here in uh, in the second notebook, I'm setting up Athena, and it's uh, pretty easy. So there are not many steps required. Um, I'm also using PyAthena. Are you using is, Parquet for your files now? Or? I'm actually showing you both. I'm actually okay. showing you how you can also generate Parquet in case you wouldn't have them already. Nice. So obviously we have them. You can just use them, or um, you can also use PyAthena to read in. Um, the TSV data and generate Parquet out of that, nice. which is done in the next couple of notebooks here. So if you're running that, um, I'm setting up Athena. I'm creating um, the database nice. here, which yeah. is called Data Science on AWS. Yeah. 
And then in a second step, and I'm going quickly over this because it's not the, the core yeah. focus. I, I have so, talked about Athena as well, so this is just, it's good to review, but we don't need to go into Exactly. The so in the second step, I just register the data. I just show you quickly what I've done in preparation here. So I create the external table and provide all of those columns. And then basically I have the table available in Athena. I can run a sample query here. To make using sure everything SQL. is ready. So star exactly and here we go so i can query the data now through athena in my s3 bucket so that's the part i did as a preparation um there's a notebook that shows you how you can convert the tsv data nice. now to okay if you're interested also we do have a couple of notebooks here um, that show redshift um, if you also want to show how you do similar things with redshift point it to data in s3 um, have a look I move on now in the sake of the time for this session to explore the data. And one thing I actually want to show you because the data set is really so fun to work with. <laughs> um, you can actually visualize the data using Athena now. And yes. here's a notebook for you. Again, I'm setting up the environment and so I'm using one question. So after yeah. we run this, if we go to our AWS account, to Athena, we will see this database created with this table inside and we can start playing directly from there. Exactly, exactly. You see them registered in Athena, you see the database, you create it through the nice. notebook here. Um, you can also do it in the UI, obviously, but uh, yeah, sure. as we're kind of working in this yeah. environment, and um, can spin I'm it up automatically. Putting things together because it's... This is Correct. all new. <laughs> <laughs> so Athena is, uh, as, you, as you know it, so you see the, the database and the table there registered. And uh, I just did it as a, as a kind of a pre-setup to actually be able to query the data now out of this notebook. And I'm also using um, some libraries, matplotlib and Seaborn, which help me to visualize data in those notebooks. Oh. So now you can do some fancy um, queries. So I can do some SQL queries here, which product categories are the highest rated by the average rating. So I just have the two in yeah. here. So um, out of those two, the digital video games has an average star rating of 3.8, digital software 3.5. And there's also code to visualize. Um, sometimes it renders a little bit crazy here. Um, if you rerun this cell, it actually um, puts it in the right scale again. And also, here's if you run that on all categories. Oh. And this shows us, actually, it's a fun thing, that gift cards are the highest rated. <laughs> sure, so everybody likes to have a gift card. Everyone likes to have a gift card. <laughs> so this is kind of interesting. Also, the lowest rated digital software. <laughs> So, and you can go ahead, right? So I have like probably around 10 questions in here, which product categories have the most reviews. Um, so feel free to have a look. Um, you can also visualize again here across the whole data, which shows that books actually count for the most ratings. Okay. Which is kind of um, clear when you think of, you know, Amazon.com started out with selling books yeah. and and More I think categories got introduced later. It's so, at least when you buy digital books, it's so integrated, the review uh, into the Kindle, for example, that when you finish a book, you get pop. Like, but when you buy something physical, it doesn't pop. Like, can you review? <laughs> you get an email and you ignore it. But with books, it's so... You have more pressure to, yeah. to review books, maybe. Yeah. That as well. Than digital software, apparently. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it shows also kind of, you know, a trend that many of those categories obviously got introduced later. Yeah. Um, so there's like less reviews than like with the first category that Amazon.com had. So good insights to the data. Yes. Um, you can also try to do like some easy um, assumptions here when you say, okay, we could actually kind of say when each product category became available <laughs> on the date of the first review, right? So it's, it's not, a, you know, 100% science, but it should give us a rough estimate. Exactly. So you can run those and have a look at those um, reviews. It's more interesting if you pull in here um, all of the data again. So there were actually 13 new categories wow. introduced on Amazon.com in 1999. And most of the other years had like between, yeah, one to three categories. <laughs> <laughs> so fun things, um, feel free to, yeah, Go and, through if you're fancy to explore the data a little bit further. Yeah, and you can do a lot of these visualizations also from QuickSight if you want to. 
play. You can also do quick sight, exactly, yes. So this is just data scientists normally pull it all in the notebook. Yeah. So but there's also um, an example of how you can do that with quick sight, nice. exactly. All right, so I think we have a good understanding of what our data is, right? So we can actually start in preparing the data. And in order to do so, I just quickly show you what we want to train. So I'm going here into my train and I'm closing down the tabs <laughs> here and create too much confusion. So I'm using natural language processing because our data set is text, right? It's review text. And I want to train a model to understand basically the sentiment and give me a classification when I say this product is great, but it's actually, you know, probably a five and a star rating. <laughs> So to do that, um, I'm using an NLP model called BERT, which is super popular in the NLP um, data science world. And for us to train that model now, we have to understand quickly some concepts. So in NLP, you actually can leverage something called a pre-trained model, meaning our data set might not be good enough to train a really good model, right? You want to use something like Wikipedia and, you know, millions of books to train the model on the language, on text. And the good thing is that um, those models are available for you to use and they nice. have to be pre-trained. So we're not going to do that part, right? I'm just grabbing a model that is pre-trained. And um, those are available in AWS and SageMaker or you need to get them from somewhere? There are, there are many sources you can do that. Um, so SageMaker has a built-in algorithm um, that you can use, or you can just use any of the open source shared pre-trained models. Okay. I specifically used um, one that is shared um, open source by Hugging Faces, pretty famous library for pulling in especially those bird models. So you, you can really like choose between choosing and, and leveraging built-in functionality, but also you can pull in anything, you know, your own code to train the model. You can pull in all the libraries you want to do. So I'm showing here how you can leverage pretty much customized environments and still, you know, see the power here of SageMaker. Yeah. So what I need to do for preparation is actually transform the text, the review text into so-called embeddings. And this is um, explained by the fact that machines don't talk to us like this, right? Machines need numbers or vectors. <laughs> So we need to transform the review text into what we call word embeddings, which basically are numbers and represent, you know, um, kind of the words transformed into that space. Uh -huh. So this is what we're doing um, a little bit more now, getting into the data science world um, with the feature engineering stuff. And again, there are like um, tools you can use, um, like tokenizers, which split the data, the sentence into those individual, you know, fragments, also called tokens. And then we're feeding in that data and actually then what we call training now, which is actually called a fine tuning, to take the pre-trained model and then optimize it for our customer reviews data set specifically. So if you're curious how to do actually this pre-processing, this is done here in a step before. And uh, this runs for a little bit, so I started that already um, before the session here. <laughs> but basically, and here you can see the embeddings, SageMaker provides you with the functionality called a processing job, okay. which you can use to do data transformations. Basically, you can execute any text. And what I'm doing here is I take it's like a data. lambda function embedded inside SageMaker. Or something. It's, it's kind of a lambda <laughs> function. It's it's a little bit more, you know, <laughs> a little bit bigger. Um, but the idea is similar, right? So you have input data again, our star rating and the text. And by providing code and, and telling um, the processing job what to execute, we're basically transforming the data set into those word embeddings. And you can see here the output. Um, it's basically a number representation. That's wow. the easiest way to think of. And this is something the model understands. We are also using the processing job to split the data into a training data set, validation and test data set. So this is also always um, one step you need to do, kind of split the data to train the model on some part of the data 
and then test how good it is performing on data which it hasn't seen before. Yeah. So this is what we're doing here. And um, here's a whole notebook how to actually set this up. Um, here's also you find the, uh, the code, the Python code, um, how to do that right here in the repo. So you can also nice. open this up and you can have a look if you're interested in NLP and how to process this. Um, it's all shared here. I don't want to bore you too much on, on the very hardcore specifics here, but basically just think of it. Um, you've prepared the training code and the processing job then runs this training code on the input data. Um, this runs for a little bit. Um, that's why I pre-executed it already. And then basically it generates the data that we need to feed in for our training. So now it's inside and our S3 bucket ready for us. Exactly. Now it's stored inside of our S3 bucket for us to use. Wow. And again, I kept track here of the processing job name so I can pick it up in the next <laughs> notebook. So we're now ready to start the fine tuning. So again, this feature engineering step has been done by the SageMaker processing job. And we're executing now here um, the training. So for that, I pull in again our SDKs. I'm pointing it to where the data lives. So this is where I basically say the training yeah. data, which we just generated, the validation, the test, and point it to the S3 location. And I can also do something maybe not everyone is aware of. Um, if you're reading the training data and the, the other data from S3, you can set a distribution strategy called sharded by S3 key. Oh. And this is helpful if you do distributed training. So let's say you spin up three instances to do the training in parallel. And let's say you have three files. Um, by sharded by a three key, that would make sure that each instance receives one file and can operate in parallel. Nice. So this is also um, a nice trick here to, yeah. to optimize. And just make sure you're, you're like have not over provision the instances. So if you have 10 instances and just one file, um, yeah. this might not be the best uh, use case. But yeah, if you have 10 files and you create two or more instances, up to 10, that definitely makes sense to use. Exactly. All right. And then with, uh, with all of the um, training, again, we can either leverage algorithms that are built in with SageMaker if you're not very deep into machine learning, or you can use your own code. And I'm showing here really um, the version we're using the own code. So again, here's a Python file for my training script. You can write whatever you know model and use case you have, and then point SageMaker training job to use your code, which is also called script mode. And this really shows how you can you know work um, as before. You have your own code, and then you can still bring that onto the platform yeah. and leverage SageMaker to execute your code. That's so cool. We're setting some hyperparameters. So those are the settings for the model. And all of you who've been working with machine learning should be pretty familiar with those. So here is specifically for this NLP problem. But basic, those parameters are basically the instances, how many, how big, and things like that. It oh. also contains exactly it, yeah. So here you can see the train instance counts. Um, I'm doing a P3 here, that um, a GPU powered instance. Yeah. If you want to do distributed training, it's as easy as just pointing here to five. So you would spin up five instances. If you want to use a different instance type, just yeah. you know, put in the name here. Um, super easy. And then the rest of the settings are more specific to the model. Exactly. Um, number of epochs, it's how many times you iterate of the whole data set. So obviously, the more you put here, the, the better the model gets, but it also obviously runs longer. Yeah. Um, so again, feel free to tune this to anything that makes sense in, in your specific use case. Um, for the demo, again, I kept it a little bit shorter here, <laughs> um, not to wait too long for the no, result. Sure. And then also something um, which is new in SageMaker is capabilities to do experiment tracking. So as I said before, you're not running just a single training job, right? You're training many models many times, and you want to make sure to keep track of them, right? Which settings did I use for, for the first one? Which settings did I use for the last one? So this is something you can do with a feature called SageMaker Experiment Tracking. Oh. And we're setting this up, so we're pulling this in here. 
we're giving it a name and a description. And then we're basically just passing that when we start the training job. And you pass all these parameters. Yes, we can define what we want to lock. So here I'm creating this tracker object. And basically it's pretty much the settings I've shown before. Nice. But you can define, right? You can just track one, you can track 10, yeah. you can track all of them. Yeah, what is relevant for you. Yeah, correct. So here pretty much all of the hyperparameter settings um, just to show here. I've never done capable. machine learning, but I have done a lot of trying and playing with things. And it's always good to track as much as you can because in your 10th try you say, hmm, what if I increase the memory? Have I done that already? <laughs> Yeah, so, um, you know, there's no harm in, in exactly. interacting more and monitoring more. All right, again, we're pointing it to um, the three locations where the input data is stored, and um, we're then creating a trial. So a trial is part of an experiment, right? So experiment is kind of the parent object, and then within a single experiment, you're creating many trials. And a trial is then the individual um, training run or a combination of training runs, etc. Again, I'm uh, telling it a couple of metrics for me to actually get here out of, uh, of the model performance, specifically to the model training, the training loss accuracy, the validation loss and validation accuracy. What is that? So this no, shows you nothing. how good the model is performing. <laughs> okay. So in, uh, in machine learning, you want to make sure um, you're minimizing the loss and maximizing the accuracy. So you want to have a model that is basically predicting as good as it can, right? So giving the training data, um, you want to make sure once you're passing it new data that it's predicting as accurate as possible. Okay. So you keep track of that. Um, and while you're training the model, um, the loss, so the, the times it predicted wrong should go down and the times it predicted right, so the accuracy of the model should go up. So those are important metrics you want to keep track of while you're training. And then just to introduce yet another service, we're kind of squeezing everything in here. So you can see really the power of using those tools together. Yeah. Um, a functionality called SageMaker Debugger, which gives you hooks into the model training. So which is really, really cool because now while the model is training, you can monitor things like the loss, which I said is not decreasing. So this is a pre-setup rule which you can just use here and then it monitors for exactly that purpose. Wow. And when the loss is not decreasing anymore, that means that you hit a level where you're um, running maybe into an overfitting. That means you're training the model to be too specific your, to your data set. Mm. And then it, wouldn't, it would be like probably 99% accurate on the training data, but when you're um, putting it to, you know, to the outside into production and you see data that is coming in, you, yeah. um, it would probably not be good anymore. So you want to avoid this situation. So you can actually look for the loss not decreasing and other rules built in. Um, you can define your own rules. Here is like the rule for the overtraining. And then debugger actually triggers an, uh, an alert telling you an alarm that you're actually running into the situation nice. right now. So really nice having those insights into the model training. So this is what we're setting up here. And then finally, we're, we're ready to, to get the training stuff job started. Um, so what I'm doing here, I'm pulling in from um, the SageMaker libraries, um, the TensorFlow object. And this helps us to define um, that we're actually creating a model and training a model here that is using TensorFlow code. Right, TensorFlow is just one of the frameworks you can use. Um, you can use PyTorch, you can use Apache and Xnet. Um, in this case, we're using TensorFlow. And as I said, um, we're using a functionality called script mode. So this means I can provide my own training code. This is the Python file nice. we had uh, before. Yeah. So here I'm pointing it to my training code. This could be any code you've been written. And if you have special requirements, TXTs, like libraries you want to put in, um, you can also point it here to a directory. This is really just for, you know, customizing as much as you need. Nice. You're giving it the IAM role and all of the parameters which we set up before, basically. So this is really like where it all comes together. You can yeah. see here the debugger is in here, the metrics definition is in here. 
And by now we can actually kick it off. So by calling the fit on this estimator object, which we created here, right? This is the estimator. We call the fit and this starts the training job. So here we're just pointing to the data sets and we're also passing the information under which experiment this is running to keep track of the results. And this starts the training job, so you can monitor okay. that. Here are links. Um, you can actually view the training job. Oh. So if you go to SageMaker, to the UI, which I'm hopping in right now here on the left, you can see under training, the training jobs coming in. So you can always have a look here how long they run. And you see there we're running here um, around 12, 24 minutes, depending on um, the data yeah. it's working on. And you can see all of the information. By the way, um, also the training time, which you asked before, right? Yeah. So we're only paying for the time that the training happened. And you can see here that this job trained for 613 seconds. Oh. So this is only the time you got built on. Nice. And SageMaker makes sure to start the instance, copies in the training code, executes it, and also tears down the instance once it's finished. So you don't have to worry if you go for, for lunch <laughs> and come back. Um, yeah. That instance has been idling. That is not happening. Um, if you manage, if you use managed spot trainings, um, you can also see here um, the amount that you saved. Oh, you can and use spot training as well for training. That's yes. Nice. Yes. So especially for all of the longer, longer running jobs, um, might be really good to look into using yeah. spot training. Um, so to really kind of make sure you taking all of the uh, cost savings that are available. Exactly. And yeah, you're seeing pretty much all of the settings, um, the training image used, um, the instance types here, it was a P3 instance, and the information to your data. So it's all really kept track of. You can see it here in the UI, or you can also pull it through the notebook. You can watch the results in CloudWatch logs, as you would expect. And you can also see um, outputs in your three bucket. So if I jump to the uh, three bucket I'm using, you also see here like the debugging output in your bucket and uh, model output, you see the model tar file. What is that? This is basically the trained model we have now. Okay. So we, we provided our Python code, which is the model training code. And we said, here's the input data and now train. And once the training job is done, it stores the model in a tar file for you to use. So basically then when you want to run this and deploy this in production, you just need that file. Exactly. So you can grab and run <laughs> or you can actually deploy it on, on the cloud. Yeah. But everything is shared so you can use and, and do whatever you want to do with the outcomes here. Um, drill down here. Here's the source um, information. So everything is documented and uh, yeah, you can poke around here and make sure it's all, you know, that's so cool. Using the right settings and performing as you would expect it. As we've included this in the experiments um, SDK here and, and actually kept track of a lot of those metrics we set up, we can yeah. actually also query those now. So here I just pulled them into a table, into a pandas data frame, which helps us to visualize the data. And you can see here the comparison of the, of the job runs. Nice. So if you're running more of them, you obviously see more. I had two of them running. Um, I think only one completed in the time mm. I, I set it to. So I see here the results. Wow, that's cool. And you can really go deep here as deep as you really want. Um, if you need to debug what's what's um, happening, you can see here the debugger results, loss not decreasing, um, no issues found. So we actually never ran into that situation, nice. which is good news. And we also didn't overtrain. Good. Good model. So, you know, training done successfully. And uh, now we can actually move ahead. We can, we can either tune that automatically even further. Wow. So SageMaker, just as a last step before we, we're coming to the deploy and wrapping. And you can leverage hyperparameter optimization, which actually finds the optimal set of those settings for you in a job. Oh, so here's also the notebook quickly. Um, Even those it, parameters that are like specific for the model. 
Exactly. So either you are, you know, an expert and you know all the answers, which pretty much none of us <laughs> will do. <laughs> um, you can spend time tweaking around and obviously leverage your, your experience. Um, but it's also helpful to maybe just fire it up and let machine learning figure out a machine learning problem. Wow. Right? <sighs> So you can you can instruct SageMaker to actually find the best settings for you. Wow. So you're just defining which which settings it should look for, and then um, basically as you do as we do here the epochs. So how many times do I need to iterate over the data, and then a couple of more specific settings maybe to your model, and you give it ranges. So explore for example between two and sixteen times yeah. over the data set which one is the best one, right? Um, to get the best results. So you're providing all that information, you set it up, a lot of uh, magic happening here. Um, and then basically the tuning job tells you which settings yielded to the best wow. um, accuracy. And here, for example, and I just had two jobs running, as you can see, and we got a model accuracy of 73%. Which is really good. It's it's a small data set, and uh, I'm just I think I ran yeah two hyperparameter optimization jobs, and already got to 73%. So That's obviously, good. and that one even stopped earlier. So um, if you're going more um, into this and and providing um, more runs and a little bit more time for the job to execute, um, you can even like you know get this to higher values. But this is actually a pretty good one for the given demo I'm doing here. Nice. And then you basically have the best candidate, and you can then deploy that into um, into production. Oh. So this is actually what I'm going to show you then in the, the next one. So that's your model with the right configuration. That's the model now with the right configuration, exactly. So all we have to do now is basically um, to put that into a state where it serves predictions, right? Because we want to test it. And, and see how it's performing. Um, so for us to do that, um, you can either do um, a rest endpoint, which you can use for real-time predictions, or there's another capability for a batch inference. Let's say if you have a, a whole CSV file, which has like, you know, those hundreds of thousands of reviews, and you can also pass that as kind of a batch operation. Can you connect this with API Gateway or it has its own API modeling? It spins, it spins up its own um, REST endpoint. Okay. So if I go back here, let me quickly jump back to SageMaker. Um, it spins up its own REST endpoint. If you go down to the inference part, um, you see the models that we just created yeah. by training. And then it configures an endpoint, and then you have an endpoint running in the environment here. Okay. So you can probably point this to other services and, and do things you know, in combination, um, but the actual endpoint gets created here in the, as part of SageMaker. Nice. So you don't have to actually worry much about it. Um, it gives you the URL where you can run the invocations, where you can test it. And uh, yeah, you can also set up um, data capturing. So you're again, keeping um, an eye on what's happening, monitoring, et cetera, detect when the model is not performing mm. as good as anymore. Um, yeah, so actually all of those things that SageMaker can help you with in, uh, in deploying. So here's the model code if you run this from the notebook. So again, you're doing a couple of installs here, setting up the SDKs, you're then creating the model. So this is what I'm doing here. So I'm pointing it to this model tar file, which we just saw. Yeah. And saying it's actually TensorFlow code version 2.10. And we're wrapping this in a model. And then you can just actually call deploy on that model. And again, say you want to have maybe one instance or 10 instances and which instance type. And this gives you the uh, the predictor, basically. So or that's, the deploy. that's an instance that is running all the time, waiting for somebody to ask them something. Correct. This is now exactly this instance and, and model which is running here. Yeah. So this just has this uh, name of TensorFlow inference. You can give it any name you want. Yeah. I just uh, normally give it a timestamp so I can <laughs> keep track of the different models I'm spinning up here. Um, but basically, yeah, this is, this is the one in service here. Nice. This is the, can serve real-time predictions. So, 
anything uh, you can pull actually the model tar down if you're like curious what the model tar mm -hmm. actually consists of so you can pull that down again and have a look so you can um, untar and then using a tensorflow command safe model cli show you can dive in oh. and you see what type of input format it expects so this might be interesting when you're doing the predictions because you need to know what kind of format you need to pass the, the input data in, right? Um, so, so you do can, you need to prepare the data for, for putting it to the predictions so, or it will happen automatically? So th this depends on the use case, right? So if I expect that, uh, that my application might just copy in the raw text from the reviews on Amazon.com, but I'm doing predictions with this bird model. Yeah, exactly. I Exactly. I would have to transform exactly. them. Exactly. So I can do this in another, you know, client application or service yeah. side. I can just like in front of the model have a little process that does that and then feeds it in in the right format. Put it a and lambda function it, or something that takes care of that. Right. Whatever you want, yeah. or a little container that is part yeah. of the inference pipeline. There are different ways to do it. Exactly. Um, so I just wanted to show you. You can go as deep as you want. Basically, here is just code that does it. Um, as a class here in my notebook. So mm -hmm. I'm doing a request handler. And this really just does this um, formatting for me. So it, it runs a tokenizer on the input data to get you to exact that, um, that input ID, the mask and segment ID is what the model is expecting. Okay. So that code is available there for you to use. That is what, what, yeah, what I just used. Um, Obviously, if you have another use case, um, code might be different. You might not even know the, need the code, maybe, because you're just passing in numbers. Whatever yeah. you want to do, I just put it in here. Um, you can spin it up um, as a kind of a container that runs mm -hmm. before the inference, however you want to do. Um, but actually, a nice thing is that you, if you have this code available, which you can do in a class library, maybe separate, um, you can pass that when you do the predictions here in the notebook. So oh. I'm pointing it to this predictor endpoint. And with a serializer and deserializer, oh. I tell I tell it from the notebook where is the code to pre-process and post-process. Nice. So you can send a string. This thing will transform it to whatever the algorithm understands, and then it will return something that the person can read. Exactly. Whatever you want to do again. Nice. Correct. So this is just now you know pre-processing, post-processing code here, and then um, you can actually run this. So I've, uh, I've run this, uh, stopped the notebook before, but basically... And um, those so two handlers are running computer. inside the same instance that the model. Again? Uh, the, those two files, the response and the request, are running in the same instance as the model. Everything is in the same thing. You can actually deploy that, yeah. So there's yeah. a thing called the, the inference pipeline. Nice. And this would basically spin up a little container. Okay. Um, it's like a three container image then, or a model. Yeah. Um, the first one does the pre-processing, then you have the actual container hosting the model, and then you also have like the post-processing part, nice. which you can spin up together, or you can do separately. Exactly, yeah, so um, you can run this, and then basically you will see um, the predictions here. Nice. All right, so the model now has deployed, which you can see here on this little um, output. So let's actually see if we can get some nice predictions here. So I'm scrolling down like crazy here again, <laughs> through all of my code we've seen before. And now I can execute this um, class here. So I'm doing a predict on the predictor object and I'm actually passing in two sentences here. So just simple ones, this is great, this is terrible and see what the model comes up with. Nice. And we got a five and a one. Can you so, put anything? Like, can I, I say, can, I can put anything. this needs more work? This needs more work. <laughs> so it's random. This is okay. It's okay. My this needs more work. Maybe, maybe the exclamation mark, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so the, this is okay when to three. Yeah, that's okay. Oh. I'll see the exclamation mark. Yeah, the exclamation mark confuses it. <laughs> You need so more, this uh, looked more like data more excitement than it with was. excitement. <laughs> <laughs> this is fun. So you can think of it. Uh, I can also say like worst product ever. <laughs> worst ever. It's actually going down to a one again. So oh, you can play nice. around and uh, check that you actually get some nice predictions. Nice. But this is basically 
what I wanted to show you, training, better said fine tuning a bird model um, on our customer reviews data set to classify on the star ratings when I just give in um, a piece of text, like a review text here. And basically the code does all the heavy lifting for me and I can yeah. see the predictions coming back. That's very human readable and understandable. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I don't know if I will ever be able to pull this off, but I, I think I got the flow on how everything connects to each <laughs> other. Uh, but I cannot wait for your book so I can read it and understand what is going on on all the yeah. details of things because so, there's so much things in this thing. It's just there, is, like... there is so much in this thing. That, that's correct. <laughs> Let me just jump back here to this uh, to this overview. So this was really just a, a really, really fast walk through yeah. um, what you can do with SageMaker. And this was just a really like small glimpse. Um, we're trying to squeeze in everything, you know, that, that makes sense and all the goodness. Um, so it might be a little bit overwhelming here in, in the first run, um, but if you're like um, going step by step, um, I hope it, it makes a little bit more yeah. sense. And the Jupyter um, documents are so well documented that sure now in a YouTube thing in one hour is very hard to go through everything, but I, I'm pretty sure that if somebody sits down, downloads this Git repo and starts reading everything, they will understand what is going on because you have put so much effort on, on writing all the different bits and pieces there. That Yes, I hope so. Yeah, <laughs> feel free to, to revisit, you know, all of the different sections here. Um, starting with the notebooks here, I think it's a good starting point. Then um, whatever pre-processing your data set needs, you can use other tools. You don't need to use the pre-processing um, the processing jobs from SageMaker, but I wanted to show it as it's kind of a new functionality here. Um, you can use any of the tools you're familiar with that make, make more sense maybe for you to use. And then um, as shown in the training, you can actually use a lot of good things like around experiment tracking, around debugger to get insights into what's happening in the model training. Um, you can optimize with the hyperparameter optimizations. And then there are different ways to deploy the model, whether you're using the REST endpoint um, or you're doing batch um, transformations, batch inferences. And yeah, really, if you don't want to spend um, all those time through the steps, um, you can also have a look at Autopilot, which basically um, does all that for you. So um, <laughs> also worth checking that even if you're like um, an experienced data scientist, machine learning engineer, it's also good maybe to have a first baseline, right? Yeah. To just give the data to the Autopilot job and see what SageMaker comes up with. And then you see all of the generated notebooks and you can further develop and uh, find Maybe that's, that's the part I should start trying out just to get my feet a little bit wet because I know very little about all this data science part and it's just like, oh, I will never be able to write those things. Then you learn and you're able to do it. But when you see it at first glance, it's, it's, it's such a different world from the normal backend development. But it's so exciting how much things that you can do and, and, and how everything is connected together. I really like the idea of staying inside the notebook and doing everything from there. Because when I start thinking about this uh, machine learning, I thought like you would be jumping all around the AWS console. I was like, that would be crazy. But I really like that everything is inside the notebooks and everything is documented there. So for starting, it's like a, a good user experience already. So. Yes, and, and obviously I was jumping a lot in the notebooks, but uh, yeah, so SageMaker helps me to have this single platform to, to operate in. Um, also, like, you know, everything is, is still locked and, and a lot of information in CloudWatch. Um, so that makes sense to, to also have a look there. And yeah, and everything also gets written to S3. So a lot of the information which we saw um, gets written to an output bucket there. So you can just have a look there for all of the information. So it's, uh, it's really highly integrated and you can see here um, a lot of services which you can use in combination to really fit um, the use case that you're trying to tackle exactly. with machine learning and data science it's, on AWS. It's amazing. So um, I think like a first step for me or for anybody that wants to get their uh, feet wet with these things, maybe just go through Autopilot and then try your tutorial here, this GitHub repo with all these nice 
demos that you have built us for us. It's like the first steps. I don't know, unless you have something that we should read or besides your book when it's out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just uh, let me quickly jump back here. So there are a couple of good resources on, uh, on the AWS website. Um, so feel free to check them out. Um, a lot of good documentation around SageMaker. And also um, there's the official AWS Labs Git repo with have which has a lot of Amazon SageMaker notebooks. So there's like, I don't know how many hundreds of notebooks available to all of the different <laughs> features. So really, really good to give uh, a quick start. Um, just pull down one of those notebooks and then you can start from there, customize. And yeah, and uh, we also do have a, a survey on our um, book website. So if you wanna give us feedback, like what are the services you're interested in, right? If, if you're missing something, um, that's always also a good way to provide feedback, and uh, we're happy to work on a couple of more notebooks in, in the Git repo there, and maybe yeah, when um, when you think the book will be out, or it's a so hard question. It's targeted <laughs> for early uh, 2021, early wow, next. Wow, nice. Um, you're gonna have an early release probably in a couple of weeks from now, so um, yeah, stay tuned. Um, early releases are just draft chapters, so yeah. it's gonna be raw insights into into what we're doing right now in writing um but it's uh, yeah a good way to get the first glimpse and then the final book probably early next year nice that's super cool so i don't know do you want to say something else i think what is the best social media for people to reach you is it github or twitter or linkedin Sure, I think, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty much on, on all of the social <laughs> channels. Um, so Twitter is a good way to reach me. Here's my handle. Um, you can leave comments um, on the Git repo, at me on LinkedIn. Um, pretty much uh, there should be an account on all of the different <laughs> social platforms if you look up my name. Cool, because yeah, I imagine there will be a lot of questions because this was so much information that uh, I think it's, it's uh, a lot of people will have a lot of curiosity after watching this. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. Yes. So thank you, Antje, for sharing all this knowledge with us. It was super cool. My my brain is like about to explode. <laughs> uh, but this was like, I think it was the episode I was the most quiet because I was just like absorbing everything you want, you were saying and, and I learned so much. Now I want to try it and, and I'm pretty sure I will do a video on autopilot that everybody on the machine learning side will laugh at me. But I would be so proud of myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sounds yeah. good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for having me, Marcia. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye. This was the video for today. I hope you like it. If you want to see more interviews or and, and specific people, don't forget to let me know in the comment box below who you would like to see. I'm always happy to reach out and ask them to be part of the show. For Antia, you can find all the links that we mentioned in the description box. So please reach out to her, ask her questions and get inspired with all the content that she's producing. She also have this every month uh, workshop on ShadesMaker. So you can join that workshop. It's like an eight hour long workshop where they do basically this example step by step. So you could go and join that workshop and learn everything from her. And I see you in the next episode of Uber. Ciao, ciao.